The big question that is sitting awkwardly within most Catholics of England is, how do we celebrate the present English monarchy? Can we and should we celebrate it? How can we reconcile the Reformation, the king who broke from Rome and established what is now the Church of England, with the present monarchy that rules within this church? Our forefathers were martyred and canonised for opposing it. In what lies a true and honourable succession? Daniel Cote Davis and Charles Coulon explore the history of kingship and what true kingship really is, and even Tolkien's own interpretation of such an important and influential topic. So brace yourselves. Charles Coulon. Where? You are an esteemed historian. You are an esteemed lecturer. You've never been in trouble once in your life. Not even once. Yeah, yeah, you've spoken yeah. at Oxford. You've spoken at Cambridge. I would like you to today have the joyful and whimsical opportunity to lecture us on why the monarchy and Catholicism can, for want of a better word, become happy bedfellows again in this particular nation. Have you got anything to say on the matter? Oh, quite a bit. Now, mind you, mind you, I can't say it nearly as well as my learned friend, Father Aidan Nichols, in The Realm and Christendom Awake. Two wonderful books I recommend tremendously on this very topic. But I do have a good deal to say, and it is a question that comes up both in this country and in the United States. Why should Catholics care about the death of the Queen, the accession of King Charles? Isn't it just a lot of Protestant frumpery? Uh, blah, 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 blah. And the answer is no, no, and no. Mm. Uh, the truth of the matter is twofold. One, the roots of uh, the British monarchy are, of course, Catholic. But more than that, those, if you pardon the expression, desiccated remains are the last example of what Catholic monarchy was like throughout Europe, all the way to Russia, really, if you think of the Orthodox as being, in this, in this area, sort of Catholic. Uh, the, sad, the sad truth of the matter is that before the revolutions of the 18th and 19th century and into the 20th, Monarchism and Catholicism were virtually synonymous. Now, of course, in Britain, as in Prussia and Scandinavia and so on, with the Protestant revolt, things sort of switched around. But what's important to remember is this. From the time of Constantine, the Catholic Church and the Catholic state were very like the, uh, the form and the matter, as uh, St. Thomas tells us. Uh, the matter being the state and the form being the church. Uh, we have, to be baptized was to become a citizen. Mm -hmm. the, the two were codominuous. Uh, and if you were outside the church, you were outside the body politic. Mm -hmm. The Reformation comes along, and in the countries where it triumphs, you have the strange situation where the, the remaining Catholics are put out. Mm. And yet, those state churches, including the Church of England, uh, and the Church of Ireland, the Church of Scotland, and so forth, continued to function in certain ways as the church had. Mm -hmm. Now, they were no longer the conscience of the king, mm. uh, quite the contrary. But they nevertheless did serve that particular function. And in England in particular, the Catholic forms were maintained to a degree they were not in a lot of places in Europe and the rest of Protestant Europe. Now, can, can I, sorry, could I just course. ask you to trace back how you understand the monarchy theologically? Because primarily, theologically, the monarchy starts with Judaism, right? And the Jewish king and all that. They will sing Zadok the priest. Indeed. And Nathan the prophet anointed Solomon king. And obviously what you have, if you're making a theological argument in Catholicism about the monarchy, it is going to be nested and rooted in the Jewish experience of monarchy. Could you, first of all, open that up for our audience who might not be familiar with that basis theologically in Judaism, perhaps link it to Christ, the Messiah who came within the Jewish faith, and then how, or I know it's a big question, but then how that organically develops into something that's distinctively Catholic, but obviously nested in Judaism. So if you could do that for our audience, then we could probably be able to see that whole history traced out before we try and make conclusions about now and the relevance now. Is that fair? Easy enough, sure. Uh, Basically, 
as early as the book of Leviticus, uh, God laid down what he wanted in terms of kingship for his chosen people. They wanted a so king. So it's not a pagan addition. It's something that is rooted no. in the God of the Jews. Not at all. Yeah. The God of Israel laid down while they were in the desert what sort of a king he wanted. Mm -hmm. Now, when the time came that the chaotic rule of the judges drove even the, the Jewish people to distraction, they wanted a king. They initially did not want a king after the style already set forth. Mm -hmm. They wanted a king like the nations, and they got Saul. Mm -hmm. That didn't end very well. But when it was over, they got David and the Davidic covenant. And this is really a very, very important part of the story. Saul anoints David as king. And that anointing becomes a really, really big part of Jewish and later of Christian kingship. Now, David, of course, his, his dynasty was promised the rule but not all the time and not everywhere. The heir, the rightful, legitimate heir to King David was Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. um, and that's and, elaborated in the genealogies that yep. you get in the Gospels and all that. That's why they go all through it on both sides. Yeah. yeah. Both his legal genealogy from his father and his personal genealogy through his mother. Mm -hmm. Bearing in mind that he didn't have a human father. Mm -hmm. So, at the Last Supper, he united his Davidic kingship to which he was heir with the communio of the church. Mm -hmm. Of course, he did other things. He originated the sacraments, he started the priesthood, mm -hmm. all that. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was also the beginning of Christian kingship. And mm -hmm. this is why in later ages, uh, the uh, washing of the feet on Monday, Thursday became mm -hmm. an important part of the year in every Catholic court in Christendom. Mm, yes, of course. It was because it was calling back yeah. to the foundation of Christian kingship. And from that time on, Christian kingship was seen as a participation yeah. in the kingship of Christ. And in the Latin tradition, it comes through the word rex. I'm not actually sure what the word would be in Hebrew for king. Uh, malak. Malak, okay. Now, in all of this, permit me to enjoy myself and to start talking about Tolkien, because he has a book, does he not, called The Return of the King. Oh, yes. And I know that you and I go back a long way in terms of our, um, I wouldn't say frivolity, but certainly joy in terms of trying to get Tolkien canonised as not a Roman Catholic, because we don't use that term, as a Catholic mm -hmm. and an Englishman. Now, Within that, I would like to sort of open that up for our audience by referring to the Dream of the Rood, which I'm sure you're familiar yeah. with, which is a wonderful, runically inscribed poem up in Scotland, which was then translated into Old English. And in that Dream of the Rood, you have a vision of Christ as a soldier and a warrior, yeah. reinterpreting the tradition of the annihilation of your enemy, which was Germanic, and turning warriorhood into the loving of the enemy. Christianizing this Germanic impulse of warrior, destiny, and might, yeah. and bringing within it the divine love. Now, that is something that is absolutely at the heart of what it means to be an English Catholic. And then, if you look at things like the Genesis story translated into Anglo Saxon, you have within that statements such as, Us is rit Mitchell that we were our wulder kuning modem lafian, also translated as, It is right that in our hearts, we should worship the glory king of angel armies, the Wuldor Kuning. Now, you see, why I'm bringing all this in in terms of Tolkien is that he was enamored by the Anglo-Saxon language. And I think a great deal of what evangelization means in England is to reawaken the roots. Oh. Because from good roots, how does Tolkien put it? I can't remember. He has a root thing, doesn't he? Funny you should ask. Yeah, well, how does it go? How does it go? I, I, he, he says something about the roots. And, he said, and it's to do with Aragorn, and it's to do with the return of the king. Now, we are in the business of talking about the return of the king today. So how does, how would I say it, how does Tolkien, in his characters, who are kings, exemplify a vision of the sort of monarchy that we have been talking about today, rooted in this impulse in the Genesis and Dream of the Rood spirit? How does Tolkien do that? Well, his king is at once the, uh, how do I put it, his king, uh, we'll take uh, Aragorn as uh, crowned now. Mm -hmm. uh, his king is uh, the chief layman in the realm, as you might say. Mm -hmm. 
He is the guardian of truth. He is the guardian of the weak, mm -hmm. which was certainly very much seen to be the king's job. The king's mm -hmm. peace is a phrase we still have today. And we all need a chief layman. Yeah. Everyone needs a layman. There we are. No, but the, 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 uh, truth of the, the truth of the matter is that Aragorn uh, really, he starts out sort of as a body Prince Charlie figure. Right, yeah. And then he becomes Charlemagne, mm -hmm. the restorer of mm -hmm. the kingdom. Yes. The remaker. Now, of course, what he remakes is not Arnor and Gondor as they were. Mm -hmm. It's rooted in them, but it's something new. Mm. It's not... Because the restoration, when we use that word, you can never restore what's been smashed, mm. but you can't put some of the pieces back together. Sure, and, and it's make... curious with him because he certainly goes on a long and winding journey yeah. of discovery to finally be anointed as the king. And I think that's interesting because it's not, in that sense, not something imposed, but it's something sort of romantically enmeshed with the narrative of life. You see, it's that, that's it's... really where it lies, is some kind of, giving a sacred dimension to the ordinary. I think that's possibly what is interwoven with Aragorn and all these figures, Gandalf, Frodo. Well, see, and, Ga and Gandalf, you know, is very much a papal figure. Sure. He, sure. Uh, he's the Guardian one who crowns the Aragorn. Line. But beyond that, remember when he's having his uh, dialogue with Denethor, mm. and they're arguing about what's, what's needed to do in the current crisis. Mm -hmm. And Denethor says... Uh, as far as I'm concerned, there is no greater good in the world today mm. than that of Gondor. Sure. And Gandalf responds, uh, you know, the Gondor in all lands are my interest. Oh. Did you not, or no, I too am a steward. Yes. Did you not know? Now, and you will enjoy this, Charles, I think, in terms of the etymology, because it's Denethor and it's Theoden. Yeah. And so the one who throws himself suicidally, well, he's rooted in the Thor tradition. But Theoden... He has a martyrdom, which looks like suicide because he throws himself into death. But it's not the same thing. No. Because as it's been touched by the secret fire, at least in ter terms of Tolkien's cosmology, that death, that kenosis of the self is actually rooted in this spiritual grandeur. And I think that's why some people say, at least in Peter Jackson's version of the film, that moment gives them, you know, hairs on the end of their arms stand up. Because it's so powerful to see people face death with that pagan dimension of not fearing, but it being rooted in a spiritual reason as well. No. So, and, well, Theoden, Theoden. Theoden's, yeah. Theoden's journey, as it were, yeah. from uh, the puppetized uh, weakling of Grima Wormtongue. Needing time, an exorcism. Precisely. Needing an exorcism. That's pulled out, yeah. and then he regains the strength and he dies a hero's death. Sure. And now I want to tie this all up because I think exorcism is a wonderful way to talk about authority. Because in Hamlet, they can't get an exorcist. And so you have this king who's lost his power. And there's all this ambiguity and the, the Denmark's glory fades, right? But when you have an exorcist, which is the gift of the apostolic tradition, then authority can be rooted in a spiritual power that liberates. I want to finish on the fact that I run a Tolkien medieval fantasy camp, Charles. I know you're aware of this. I'm bringing it from New Zealand to America to evangelize young people in America, and I just wanted to tell you about that, Charles, because it's rooted in this vision of the return of the king. I've committed my whole life to this, and I just ask for your prayers for this particular mission to the American people. God bless you, and have a wonderful time here in Walsingham. It was so wonderful to be with you. Thank you. Thank you.